Well, we have it here. It is a classic model, well known for Trek, the 520 Touring Bike. This bike has been around in their lineup for decades. This is a newer version. Let's review. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hi, I'm Justin the guy. Obviously, I have a garage shop. Taking scary how to use bikes one bike at a time. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Welcome back to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging with the guy. Hey, I'm Justin the guy on this old bike series. Right behind me is a Trek Classic. Actually, so classic that this particular model is spanning decades. <laughs> you can't say it with a lot of models. Well, there's a few that are out there. Probably like the Olay from Specialized and the Roubaix and a couple other models out there. But this was one of their staple workhorses. I want to say we sold a lot of these back in the day in Parker Bikes when we were a Trek dealer. But it was one of those we'd do one or two here and there. But they become a little more relevant to today's riding. You know, the whole gravel adventure type riding. Well, now this bike fits in that quite nicely. So let's review and start tearing into this thing and get this bike ready for its new owner. So what we got here is a hoss of a bike. Oof. These were not known to be light and currently still not known to be light. That's where the gravel bikes kind of fit in. But when you're looking at something that you're gonna be taking touring and gravel style type of riding, you want strength over weight because you're gonna load these things up anyway. So it's, so it's kind of like one of those weird things which I didn't quite get the concept back in the 90s or late 80s personally because I was like, oh, lightweight, mountain bike, blah, 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 blah. Turns out these are awesome little workhorses they're simple-ish. Um, they've always been meant to be that way. They're supposed to have like a rack on this in the back and the front, that kind of thing. Um, and they're steel, most of them are steel frames of the 520s. I think they may have made a aluminum version in like 2020. This is a, a 2012, I believe. So it is the newer iteration. The ones I remember seeing these back in the 90s were like this, um, what was a British green color? Kind of follow suit of the old school Raleigh's. If you know what I'm talking about, put a comment down. Anywho, um, this does have the more modern componentry on it. It has the V-brakes, which have more power versus the canties, that kind of thing, which is nice because when you're trucking along with 50 pounds with the gear on top of you, as well as the bike, oh man, you need, you need something to slow you down. The newer versions, I think in 2019, 2020, that's when they went to disc. Um, prior to that was the V-brakes on these guys. Um, it has a Pacific style type touring kind of crank set, which has a little bit of a, a pant protector kind of thing to keep you. Um, also has a mountain bike rear, which a lot of them did. And you'll see mixes of these throughout the, you know, using road to mountain co combination. It's meant to be a boss of strength, right? It's supposed to be like a stable. Uh, I think this is like a, not the 32, but a 36 spoke wheel. So the wheels are designed to take that load. You gotta have that weight distributed, right? And the front wheel, check this out. This is a dyno hub which means it'll brighten your life. These are kind of cool. It's like a self-generator built into the hub and it has a little running lamp up front. It's nice to have for safety, right? Especially if you're doing those cross-country tours. You might be riding an area where it's more cloudy or more rainy like Washington State or you're riding into the later or the early mornings, kind of that dusk time. You want to have something that definitely kind of brings it out. It is kind of a cool feature. Um, this one's been upgraded to it. I think, if I remember correctly, they had a model of the Dino Hub on it, um, but I can't pinpoint the year in my hour and a half of searching the interweb. I couldn't find it. Um, so if you if you do come across the Trek link or something, put that below so the rest of us know did it come with it or was it just a 2012 and they just upgraded it? Looks like they upgraded it because 
it is taped on there on the front the cabling's taped on there typically when trek or any company that's integrated a like a hub like this it would have like a pathway for those cable systems like with your disc brakes that kind of thing they kind of oh well you know make it so kind of deal maybe not but that's that's what i'm feeling so this kind of has a nice upgrade it does have the fenders from uh, planet bike which are pretty decent and still in pretty good condition I think I'm gonna keep those on there on this particular one because it just kind of fits the vintage on it. I believe I do have a rack or two that may fit the back. I doubt if I have a front rack, but I'll at least have a rear rack. So I'll add that to the finished product, which is kind of a cool thing. You know, it is a touring bike. That's what it's, what it's for. So when I did pick this up, it was from the original owner. They did some touring. So it's had some use, granted, but since these are workhorses, I didn't feel like it's you know going to be too much of a too much of a terrible lift getting this thing back into shape. In addition to it's a smaller frame and this this lady is uh, a buck ten um, wet. I mean it's like one of those things like it's a light rider. I don't think this had too much. And maybe the packs were probably more of a tear to it, but the actual oomph of the motor probably didn't put a huge amount of wattage on this. I could be wrong, I, you know whatever. Uh, but I did. I already assumed a few things when I was looking at this. Like, okay, it was used. The tires still look like they might be in good condition. If not, I might have to replace those. But, you know, a guy, this kind of guy, when you're pushing weight, the chain is <laughs> sloppy. Let's check that again. So your chain checker goes in here, and you push it, the lever over, it goes all the way, and it actually has space. So it's overly stretched. This may need to be replaced. The chain rings look okay, but like I said, that may be something that does have to be attended to. Other things I noticed right off the bat, it needs brake pads. So I picked out a, a couple of these. Um, these are actually the insert types. The ones that are on there were not, so it's kind of an upgrade. So whoever yeah, decides to go with these, um, all weather compound, I found a pretty good deal on those. Um, here's the chain, nine speeds, gonna go on that guy. So I know some of the, you know, the tape was, I replaced all the tapes on all the bikes so most, most of the time. But the hood on this one's kind of chunked up, kind of chunky. Um, nobody's gonna want that. So I went to go look for hoods. I'm like, I'm not finding the hoods. I think it's a Tektro brand um, or a Bontrager, I don't know what brand it is. But I was like, what I, I did come across these. Well, these are the Tektro, which is a pretty well-known brand for brake systems in the cycling world. And I was able to get a set for usually what the cost of hoods are. I got this for 22 bucks at Jensen's USA. So that was kind of a big score. I'm like, okay, I'll just replace them and not have to worry about trying to find a hood that may magically match because, you know, I don't want to go that direction. Um, so in that case, I'm going to go ahead and strip that, replace all the cables and housing, and basically do my, do what I do. Uh, in addition to this particular frame, I'm going to do some um, cleaning magic, also, you know, kind of detailing. It is not very thick paint job. It's kind of closer to the style of Amon, so it's more of a light and polite cleaning and polishing. And then in that case, I'm going to try to look for some kind of an agent that's going to be uh, more of a protective. So I'm gonna start playing around with some ceramics, adding to my repertoire of polishing and detailing frames, like cars. Um, I never detailed cars. I think I car waxed a car twice in the holy 52 years being on this planet. So, you know, uh, but when I got into frame detailing, it was like, this is kind of cool because for me, I like bikes and hey, I like to make them sparkle, whatever the case, especially on those Klein frames that you might want to check out the video I have listed somewhere. Anyway, let's get into this. Um, so with the particular Dino Hub, there's nothing to be too afraid on these guys. Let's show you. So all you really need to do is unplug this port. That's just your waterproof uh, plug in here and everything else, you know, you do your brake. Everything else is the same. This is a quick release deal. And this just drops out once you pass those layer tabs. Like so. Fenders will give you a little bit of hass, but you know, 
And then these will have like a, it's really hard to kind of figure out if they're too tight or too loose. Basically, I'm going to adjust it on the non-battery you know, non or non-plug-in side to kind of see if I can loosen this up. It feels not notchy, but the notchiness is actually the generator that's built in, pre-built in this hub. These are kind of cool. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of a fun, self-efficient, you know, green way of lighting up things. And you can kind of look at the rim. It has some use, but actually these are not in too bad shape skewers match all that good stuff so um, yeah we're gonna dive into the rest of this so when you're trying to release the rear wheel you want to drop this down to the smallest cog that pulls the derailleur out of the way so it's easiest and what you do is um, you release the brake the brake is has this kind of what they call the noodle and you pull the little cover over and you push it together and there's a little slot that it pulls out of. Now this wheel can drop out and I checked it in these brake pads you can see from this angle that they're toast. And from there you can just do the quick lease, flip it up and the wheel should drop out and you can aid the derailleur down so it's kind of out of the way when you release it. I've been doing the same thing here, double checking the hub, uh, make sure it's smooth but not loose. And I kept, cassette, I'm going to test it when I get the new chain on there and put a lot of stress on each cog while I'm pedaling to see if I can get that chain to jump. Visually, it looks okay. Um, so it could be a good chance it's okay. But if not, I'll have to find another 9-speed with this range to put on this bike. Not that I'm going to save this chain, but if it has a quick link, I'm going to use it. But I'm also going to keep it to the side so I can measure it, make sure it's the right length. It was a little tight. And you clear that off like so. So, so I am going to replace all the cables and the housing. I do just go ahead and trim all these. This one is an interesting one because this trailer is designed to do either direction. And including the brakes. Once I have those clipped, then I just take the cables out. I do save the housing to remeasure. Set that aside and open this guy up. And I do see, you know, some build up dirt on here. So I will pull these pulleys apart and give it a good cleaning on inside. And as you can probably see in here, getting a good, a good amount of dirt. So this guy can definitely use some ultrasonic cleaning. And to the front. Again, replace this, take the cable out so I don't poke myself. These guys also have two cages up top and they have one underneath, which is kind of interesting. So you could really load up with that water. Uh, nowadays, you know, they have the camelbacks and you can get like the pack that goes on the rack itself that may have a bottle carrier too. So you can really carry a lot of water, but you know, keep that in mind. Ugh. The water is weight and you got to carry that. This has come with the LX front derailleur and these are kind of fun. You can see the rust on there. Hopefully that cleans up. You know, it looks like it's in pretty good shape still. Uh, it definitely needs to be cleaned. But these derailleurs are designed to be either top pole or the bottom pole cable so you can actually get this guy to work either direction. Very versatile. And as for the brakes, you want to make sure you don't lose this boot and noodle. These are not easy to find or replace. And I will keep the housing. And you can see how dirty that little guy is. So I'm going to definitely clean that out, put some fresh lube in there, and replace this piece here. And then after that, these are brake bosses. So basically, you take your Allen and then screw this out. And that's where that brake works and it has adjustment screw on both sides. You can equalize those brakes so they contact the rim equally when they're adjusted. These do come with a blue Loctite dab on the bolt, so sometimes you'll have to fight that. Um, looking at this is pretty dirty. It would be nice to be cleaned up. In addition to, these brake posts should have a nice little layer of grease on them. 
that keeps it just you know very smooth so it's really good that we're actually tearing this apart to this level this is going to clean this all out and refresh flush it out with fresh lube then you repeat on the other side i keep these brakes together front and rear and i clean them separately in ultrasonic cleaner so i don't get them mixed up just reason being i don't want to keep the rears rear and the front's front most of the times we use the brake pads, even though I'm going to be replacing the brake pads, I still will be doing that as well because the spring tensions are adjusted to those and it's kind of, you don't want to start off with square one. And keep mindful, there's three positions on these on the back side here. Um, so that pin typically goes into the middle one, but if you need higher tension, for some reason this is not providing enough tension on to pull the cable back, you have this upper hole to put that pin in. And also a lower hole if you need to adjust that. These have a lot of adjustment to it. And you see here, there's spacers. Those could be swapped as well. So you can really go down a rabbit hole real quick um, to adjust these. And since these seem to be adjusted pretty close, it just needs to be the replacement of the pads. I'm going to try to replace, put these back to how they were because they were set up correctly to begin with. And the reason why you keep the fronts front and rears rear. On road bikes, the actual post of the brake itself is different. And my focus is still in the middle. And you can still see a lot of that dirt. A little bit of grease on this one, you can see. Um, that's what they're supposed to have. But unfortunately, this other one did not. Save the boot, save the noodle, keep it separate. Take the old cable off. That seems kind of tight, so I want to make sure that's not been compromised. You have that weird give feel sometimes, and you're like, oh, is that stripped? And how this is tucked in here, that's designed on purpose. Keep the cable from not boinging out and uh, getting torn caught on something and a fraying so you want to tuck those in this light's kind of tool too because it has a reflector as well built into it and if i remember correctly these have an extra wire ports so you can run a wire to the back which this one does not have so you can front generator can generate both front and rear light which i might take a peek and see how much those are if i can find one again dirty a little bit of grease on the fork, so this one was actually a little more well maintenanced. So this one does have the upgraded through crank, which is kind of nice, and pull these cables out of the way. Don't have to worry about the internal routing on these, which is nice. It's all external. So um, again, these guys were really were designed to be user-friendly, pretty straightforward. Especially to today's uh, bikes that are coming out, have been getting really, really complicated. Um, this one is a 48 centimeter. It probably says it somewhere, but you'll have a stamp serial number here as well as a sticker from the Trek. And it has a little uh, recycling symbol here recycled steel. Kind of cool. A uh, little ventured piece there. And then we're going to. Make sure your arms are nice and firm inside the bolts here. You don't want to strip these bad guys out at all. And you kind of, I wonder if I'm capturing that, see little bits of dirt <laughs> coming out of the bolt hole. So I'm going to make sure those are good and clean. And this guy does have this little tab which is used on this hook to pop up. But for that, I need to take this adjuster cap off. And a lot of these will have their uh, Newton meter torques on here uh, telling you what it needs to be. This one's 12 to 14. It's the range. Okay, so you got, my goodness, look at all. Yeah, it's like caught fuzz. These are hollow through this side here. So it probably is just stiff coming through and you got that little hook pops this little guy there's a little pin in there that pushes goes into the uh, crank arm I'll show you the little micro hole that goes in the idea is when you compress this in there's a the little micro hole 
and the pin pops down. Get this right. It should oh, see a little pin stick down. Oh, I can feel it with my finger there. You maybe see it. That pin fits in that hole, and once you get that compressed enough, that should be able to fit in that hole, and that means you're good or close enough to have been adjusted. This bottom bracket also has some spacers on this, so it pushes that crank out. Really, ah, it's designed. Set that aside. So, ah, since it is hollow, ooh, you can see my other side. Uh, that's where the dirt was coming in, which I can feel. <laughs> yeah, I'll take a brush and get that cleaned out. You can kind of see a little bit of surface rush, rust in the inside there. So looking at the chain rings, this is where I'm going to get a better look at it. Um, not really too sharp teeth. Um, you're looking at the you know, valleys and some flat tops. So most likely on these particular ones, the middle ring and the small one were probably used the most pushing that load. The big ring probably not as much. So and this is kind of a mountain bike uh, sizing. You got a 36, 28, and if I venture to guess, it's probably a 40, a 42, or 44 bigger. So, um, where are you? Oh, you're probably stamped somewhere in here. Let me get my cheater so I can see. 48, 46, 48 tooth here. So, that's your crank. And... We want to check these bearings. You want them smooth, not notchy. Actually, these feel actually pretty smooth, considering these are actually very inexpensive to switch out if you need to. Um, you just need to have a tool that fits in the spine portion and pops it out. If you do get a new set, you got to be mindful of the spacing spacers and keep them. So you got two on one side and one other. That adjusts the chain line of the crank set, either or, and also gets you the crush correct compression. And there's that bottle cage mount, like I mentioned, underneath. Be kind of tight with the, all this going on. So it'd have to be either a small bottle or you can mount a pump or something like that if you wanted to do something with this particular mount as well. Okay, I think we're getting to the point where we can start inspecting the frame. I got enough stuff off of there to start taking a look. I use uh, Purple Power half water, half purple power. You can get a Walmart or off of Amazon. Um, this way I can kind of start cleaning the frame. What I'm looking for is any major damage pieces. Um, this one would be cracks, big stress or rusty spots since it is steel. Get anything off of here where I might find dings. Um, because these do sometimes Got to be mindful, go through a little bit of abuse. I mean, it's a touring bike. They get lugged around, they're ridden hard and long days and usually really bad weather and um, all those kinds of things. Not to say that should deter you, but definitely want to look into all these tubings and make sure nothing's compromised. You're not seeing welds failing. And granted, these were designed for that, so they are pretty beefed up in a sense. Not like a Bontrager frame beefed up, like I've seen others. Oh, that's kind of cool. The cable housing is on the top part for the brake, so you can get a pack in here easily or also pick it up, kind of like a cycle cross bike. Yeah, I stole that idea from Cycle Cross World. There are some scratches on this fork on the drive side. And a little bit on the non-drive. So from either parking racks or stuff during its tour, it's telling me stories. You know, the spike is telling me it's been places. It's seen things. It's seen things. Um, <laughs> but it wants to go back out there. It says, I'm okay. I'm fine. Stop poking at me. Um, yeah, so we're going to clean this beauty up. Another little... We use steel symbol on the fork on the inside. Cute little stickers. Kind of, and they do it when they, before they clear coat it, so it's actually very deliberate. So, what I might do um, to make it easier for me is I might remove the fenders because I have to get into these bits here. 
up front. That gives me the opportunity to, to clean those bolts out and if they need a little bit of grease, gives you a better contact point. Also, I can clean that area a lot better because right now I'm like kind of trying to floss. I'm not gonna cut corners there. I'm already gone this far. Take the cage off, double check these bolts, make sure their threads are not compromised from cross threading or what have you. Um, the light may have to come off too. So this will be a little more of a project of putting back together due to the fact I gotta worry about fenders. But these fenders don't seem to be too terrible. In my years of working on bikes, there's been fender sets out there. We will drive a mechanic insane. They will see red. So, case point, small story, Parker Bikes. A fender set underneath a baby carrier, baby seat. You know, the ones that go on the back, which are wholly and wholly unsafe. Um, yeah, I remember a story of... My parents had one of, those, one of their first mechanics, I forget his name, um, but older guy, and he was like frustrated trying to get this all the, because you got a bolt I mount multiple things with one screw, and it kept on moving around on him. He got so bent out of shape over this thing. All they saw was curse, 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 and his baby seat just being chucked right out of the service department. Not its best moments. Probably not the bike shop's best moments. Hopefully there wasn't very many customers who were going, oh, what the heck? So yeah, be mindful when you have a baby seat and fenders and whatever other junk you're going to try to put on that bike. <sighs> try to find your zen moment. Think about it. Lay it out and take your time because it will drive you literally mad. Uh, the reason why the baby seats are considered not very safe is you have that extra weight on the back of your bike. Um, so if a kid leans for a dog or something like that, it'll really kind of notch you over. And if you're not a very strong rider or not anticipating it, it could take you down. Also, if you do crash or fall, that kiddo is attached to the bike, which is attached to basically kind of you. You can bail off the bike, but poor kid's stuck with it. That's where the trailers are huge innovation in baby kid safety uh, bikes because they're in their own little roll cage thing in the back and they're safe. And uh, yeah, I don't know why I'm going on about, oh yeah, the mountings. But in any case, if you're gonna do a kid, put it in a kid carrier. I don't care what brand it is, as long as it's been you know, by the CCCP safe or whatever. And it, it, the chat attachments are kind of a pivot too. So if the bike falls over, the trailer's not gonna roll as well. And it's also good to have helmets on those little kiddos inside of that trailer. Um, it's just like a roller cage Jeep thing for them. Um, I've seen really fancy ones. I've seen people take these off-road, dirt roads, that kind of thing. You know, kids are having fun and winning back. And there's, you know, toys flying everywhere. Um, I used to roll with my daughter with hers back there. And halfway through the ride, she'd be doing this. And be like, oh, okay, it got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> but anywho, this bike has a lot of mounts. <laughs> that could be mounted to it, but um, this one does have dual mounts in the back where the rack goes to one and the fenders go to another. And this also has fender racks and mount racks separately as well. So this was designed for it, but if you got that fancy nice carbon bike that doesn't have any mounts and you're trying to put fenders on it and a child carrier, you might want to do a little research on it or consult your local bike shop. It's like, is this doable? And they can tell you flat out no, and you're just going to have to go, okay then get yourself a less expensive bike and use that for your uh, trailer or tag along, which I'm growing up to now, or my daughter's growing up to now, that kind of riding. So, case in point. So I'm gonna go ahead and still proceed to do cleanup here. We'll do a little recap of the parts and what I need to put on there. And the final result, we'll do a recap of the whole experience and some beautiful pictures of the bike and the final results. So let me get back to work here and figure out where I'm supposed to be. Part of the interruption, there is more. More you say? Push the more button. Push it. Push it. I dare you to push it. Once you push that button, you get more details about the video you are watching in addition to all the tools that I use in the shop as well as suggestion for improving your ride. In addition to, to help me provide advocacy in the cycling community, also links to other social media accounts as well as my website to find the products that I actually sell and other insights in the industry. Other videos linked below, extend your cycling experience here on YouTube. And now back to your original programming. Well, here we are. Got the crank set, 
cleaned up. It cleaned up pretty well. It has some weird kind of um, delamination of the coating here, but it's still intact, so it's still really good. The brakes cleaned up pretty well. They did a little, have a little bit of surface rust, but they're going to be lubed. We'll have to check the cassette when we get a new chain on there. There's the new chain. Brake pads obviously need to be replaced, but if you look at these guys, they don't really have much material left to them, so that's going to be replaced. Oh, look at all these bolts. Those are fender skewers on top of bottle mount skewers, so it's going to be a challenge to remember where all those go, but hey, eventually it'll get there. Skewers, of course, cleaned up, blew up the derailleur and cleaned up all the jockey pulleys and also the front derailleur itself. It does have a little rust on there, but wants lube to be good. Now, those are the brake levers in the box and the wheels. The rear trued up really well. The front, that is a good question because the front had some good hops in the rim. And there lies, I don't know if there's somebody laced this up for them or they tried it themselves, but obviously it wasn't dished or tensioned. So whoever did this front wheel didn't do a great job, but it is not damaged, which is good. Secondly, is now all fine tuned and ready to go. That is a sneaky one that would catch somebody by surprise if they took it into a shop to be worked on. And bam, the frame, all polished up, ready to go. <gasps> Wait a second. We need to review this part. These brake levers have to come off and it's not gonna get around here. How do we address bar end shifters? Let's review that. Extra, extra, read all about it. Well, extra, extra is gonna lengthen this video. And you know what? The longer, probably the better because the more detail you see me working on the bike. I know there's some people out there like, your videos are too long or whatever the case may be. Well, it really does take a bit of a time to work on this stuff. And in this kind of scenario, as I'm jibber jabbering, I sometimes come across things that I would miss or edit out. So here's the full extended version. Well, anyway, this guy has bar and shifters. I'm gonna focus on this because I don't have very many bikes that come through here with bar and shifters. This is an opportunity to show you what these bad boys are all about. Well, basically a bar and shifter is, let's first review, it's actually a shifter that originally came from the down tube shifter. In the back old days when you ride and you had to go shift, you go, oh, oh, ran into the car. Anyway, that happened to me years ago, but bar and shifters are down here. STI made it a lot better. This was also an integration to move these bars up, so it made it a little bit easier to shift. And you'll see these also on triathlon bikes where the bar ends, will, the shifters will go on the far end when you're laying down. So they still have a purpose today. Still people are very traditionalist for touring style bikes or some gravel bikes. They like the shifters down here. They're lighter weight, a little less um, technical per se, easier to work on. But how do you remove these? Well, that's one thing. Other thing is I want to kind of review is what's their functionality? Close up. Okay, this is the non-drive side or front shifter, if you will, is on the left side usually. And you can see how it just it's a friction. So that's the situation where you need to have this tightened up to some level with a flathead screwdriver. You're gonna have to have a short flathead to get in here to get to the screw. It's like pretty basic, but very effective. Uh, but these little buggers, you wanna make sure they're tight. Um, I guess some leverage on here Ugh, to loosen that up. But you want them tight because if they're not tight, it'll just like slide down. <laughs> Funny little story. Uh, customer of mine back in the 90s, he had the ones that are actually on the frame, right? And he's doing these mountain pass rides. His shifter screw backed out, so it kept on dropping down. It kept on dropping down on the drive side or the right side, which would be your rear shifter. So he was stuck doing all these passes in the small string in the back. All you needed to do is tighten up this little screw. He thought the whole thing blew up, but it was just an adjustment. Man, he was shocked. He's like, yeah, two turns and boom, you're done. One of those, oh, you gotta be kidding me. So anyway, those are something you wanna double check. Um, on the other side, same thing, there's a flathead screwdriver. How to remove these, we'll talk about that in a second. I wanna review the other side. Okay, this is the rear shifter here. And when you're looking at this, there's this little loop, loopy thing that pops up. 
There's probably a good technical term for it, but I have no idea. Uh, basically, this has two settings by adjusting this alone. It doesn't deal with the actual screw flathead there. One is called STI, Shimano Integrated System, which means you got each notch for each gear. This also has a beautiful benefit that the new shifters do not have. As you flip this up, you'll hear it click, and this becomes a friction shifter. So if you have some cable tension that gets all out of whack and can't get in those gears just right, you can flip it from the STI index shifting to the friction shifter. And this is the beauty of a lot of people like this particular bike or this particular shifter, that kind of thing. So you can adjust it up and down. And again, back in the day, it was over here. Now they boot over here and sometimes it's on the bar ends that are sticking out. Well, how to remove these? Well, it's pretty straightforward. You got a flat head screw and you just basically unscrew this out. It is notched, so there's only one way to put these guys on, but put it in the relaxed position, which is straight down on both sides to do this. And you'll kind of see this bolt on the other side here starting to back out. That's the, the bolt, nut, whatever you want to call it. This is threaded all through, this slides right out. You can see how this one's squared off, it has a notch pin to it. And then you have this flush piece here. You don't want to make sure you don't want to lose that guy or it's never going to work. So that's how this guy fits in, okay? Um, when these were down here, same thing, but this flush pin, it, just not, it wasn't flush. The spacer here is actually concave or convert, no, rounded like your today's little bits you see how that's curved that's you know fits in there well it goes the other way but it fits in there like so well this had actual piece so technically if you could just get a separate set of these and put them down to down tube if you want or if you want to switch it there um, but you know I really recommend still keeping it on here so once we get the shifter off don't get these confused um, they are specific to each side so you want to make sure right is right and left is left you kind of put it back together, set that there. So you'll see there's like an Allen bolt inside there. So we've got to figure that one out, which, which one is that? So, oh. oh, that's not it. Maybe it's the next size, it's a five. And what, yep, yeah, it looks like it's a six. So. Basically, this is a wedge, like the old school quill stems. And, and this is reverse thread, that's right. I was like turning it and like, ah, oh, there's something to this. So that's your mechanism here to tighten and to loosen. So don't get those confused because these are either right or left as well. So now this is free. Now I can go to my brake lever which of course is gonna be a different Allen size, number five looks like. Goes on the inside here. Then you loosen up that band and it slides off like so. And that's how you get the brake lever completely off. Whoop, it got tight on me again. Sometimes these bars will flare out on certain parts. So, whoop, I lost my but uh, there we go. A couple more turns. Okay, that should be about as good as it's going to get to come off. Come on. Uh, fight it, fight it. There we go. All right. So that's how you get the brake lever off. Then I got to put on the new brake lever. So I got to pop this open. Figure out which one's right and which one's left. This one actually is marked in the box, right hand, left hand. So can't get too confused on that. All right, so here's your brake. Um, this is kind of a fun little feature here, this little notch here. So if you need to release your brake, so you can get your tire off as a super wide, push that in, that opens the lever forward out, that gives more cable slack. Then once you're done, you just put it back in place and it snaps. Cool little feature. To get brake hoods on, uh, brakes on there, you need to pull the hood up. 
so it doesn't bind up against your bar so you're not fighting it. Same thing, it has a bolt that goes through this side here, which is my five millimeter. Obviously this is tightened up by the manufacturer, so I'm gonna loosen this up as much as I can without it falling off, which it just did. Okay, so that way I'm gonna just slide it on here. You can do either way. This way I'm gonna to try to fight it and figure it out. <laughs> This direction. So get my tool in there, it's lodged in my bolt, the compression of the brake, it's going to hold my tool in place as I'm trying to guide the bolt into the nut clamp sleeve. And hopefully that will catch. There we go. And these particular bars have notches on them right here. So I can kind of well, they're just lines, and I can just indicate where I want the brake. So that way I can match both sides. I'll line that up to the position that you desire. And this is not the end-all be-all before you wrap. So you can put all the stuff on there, adjust it, whatever, and then wrap the bars after you kind of get on the bike and adjust it. You can even test ride it without the bar tape on there just to make sure with all your spots in, in place. Then from there, you go back and slide your mount shifter, and this is reverse, so you gotta unscrew it to tighten it, like so. Going back to your bits, now to put these back on. Remember, it was in the down position, right? So, I'm gonna put this guy, these are keyed. So this key's in there, which means it's two sides flat, so it only goes in one direction so it won't roll around on you. I had it in there, there we go. Like so. And this bit, it's pretty universal. You just need to get in there so it fits flush. It'll be a flush position. And then you get your shifter, since you knew it was on the down position, it'll fit in that like a notch. Come on, oop, shopsies, take a shot. Where are ya? Oh boy. There we go. So it feels secure, right? With your fingers? <laughs> then you can test it, pressing your fingers, and see if you're adjusting up and down. And you take your mounting screw by holding my thumb, holds the back so it doesn't slide through. And you do the tedious task, and you got to have a short, flat head. I should need a little bit shorter one to make it a little bit easier, but this one will work. You know those stubby little screwdrivers, and you're like, why do we have these? Well, this is what it's used for. All right, so before you're done, I'm going to check it back to both sides, and boom. You got your brake lever replaced, and you shift her back in spot. I'm going to take this part again and give it a good cleaning, um, but I got the brake lever on there. Then I'll repeat on the other side. So yeah, touring bikes, you'd think they're simple. Well, they're different. Therefore, it throws a lot of mechanics off because they're not used to the more simple type shifting, um, then they'll have to go look at some videos and try to figure all that out. And they get hung up when you need to switch this up. There's a special way of wrapping the bars too because you have a cable going underneath. So that's kind of a little a tricky bit. Experience will definitely help there. You try to just get it even on both sides if you're doing it yourself. Um, but once you get the, all the cables laid out and then test ride it, make sure it's all in the right position for you. Um, you can do measurements prior to do that. Um, if you're trying to match exactly where your, um, your shifters and your uh, brakes are at uh, the previous setting. In this case, I'm completely doing it. There's not a new owner yet, so therefore, those are kind of things I'll adjust. Another side note on that, some high-end custom builds, they won't wrap the bars until you actually come in the shop to be fitted to them. That's if they provide that included fitting 
uh, type thing or you pay extra for it. But anywho, sometimes they won't wrap the bar. Um, one of the crazy scenarios was Cervelo's a few years back. Um, it might be some of the higher and newer bikes too today that everything's kind of pre-length pre on it, not, not pre-cut. So like the steer tube and some super custom things. And once you get fitted to it, then they go in and chop all this ex excess off. Um, kind of funky to me because you're really just customizing a bike to one person and highly unlikely that's the, not the only owner that bike's going to have. So the next owner down the road, buyer beware, you may have to get a new seat post, a new stem. Um, if you need to get a super long extension on here, that's the fork. Um, so anywho, just something to think about. But this particular bike, to recap, the, nine, the 520, stable of one of the touring bikes that Trek had for decades, which they were known beginning in 1976 as steel frame bikes. This kind of goes back to the grassroots. It kind of candle lined for a year or two, and they're like, oh, we got followers, and they came back and refurbished it with a, or revamped it with disc brakes and so forth. That's the 2020 model and 2021 model. Which is kind of cool, kind of intriguing to get one myself, but I haven't found one of my size yet in the used market. But these things are solid, upgradable. Um, what's nice about it, it has a longer wheelbase built as like a brick. I mean, they are solid, uh, as well as the wheels on this, you know, 36 spokes versus 32, which is your higher spoke count strength ratio. Component trees designed to haul weight, so it's a, usually a mixture of mountain with road. So you can actually push up those mountain passes on road, even though it's road, you still have to do some spinning to get up there. Because you're loading these guys down to like 50 pounds of gear, if not more, including you. So therefore, a good frame, it's very solid. These are workhorses. I mean, they're just they're solid bikes. I mean, you're not going to go fast, but that's not the point. You're touring checking out the sites. The gravel riding is kind of the same thing. Yeah, check out, I mean, there's gravel racing, don't get me wrong, but for recreational, which is the other 95% of us that just like to cruise around, go camping, and go ride some bikes and have fun, and after a while, we're not worrying about our weight, we're having some fancy cocktails or whatever the case may be at the end of the day. So, anywho, these are pretty sweet. They're solid. This was a lot of fun to work on. Um, yeah, once I get this all back together and strung up, we'll get some beautiful pictures after this. Welcome back to Another Guy.